God bless you, Shekinah Worship Center. Good evening to you. Uh, it's good to come to you via this medium. Uh, of course, I'm not there physically with you, yet I am there thinking of you and always rooting on the people of God as they are being taught a lesson. So tonight, tonight our deaconess in training, uh, Sister Danielle Vaughns, will be teaching on a particular topic, which I'm going to introduce to you, and then she's going to take it from there. And so tonight, I wanted to have us to share with you around this topic, managing the particulars through the process to produce the product. Again, that's managing the particulars through the process to produce the product. Now, the main thought being with this text, we want to focus on the relationship that it's not about individuals or individual items, but it's the working together of these items to produce a particular product. And with that in mind, I want to read from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. Verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. So let's talk about it for a moment before I hand it over to Deaconess in training. Paul had a relationship with this church. He knew them and they knew him. Because they gave to Paul, Paul was able to encourage them that anything that God began, God will finish. Again, this speaks to relationship not only the relationship between Paul and this church in particular, but the relationship between God and his church. Paul had a beloved church, Philippi, and God has a beloved church, people, Philippi, those that love him unconditionally, no holding back, show forth that love, and show forth the love of God by keeping the word of God, by fulfilling the word of God. Now, when you are in right relationship, and note that I said right, when you are in right relationship, things will work out. It will take some work, yet it will work out. And most of you know, if not all, relationships are work. And in order for relationships to grow, it's a process. Now tonight, you will walk with Deaconess in training, Sister Danielle Vaughns, as she works through a process. As she works through and walks through this process, she will relate the natural process of making bread, bread making, to the spiritual process of becoming a mature disciple of Jesus Christ. Much as a chef must go through a process of steps to produce a product, so must you. Each child of God must yield their life to the process of sanctification so that who they began as, they are transformed from that person into a new creation. In this teaching, she will cover the following five main points. Point number one, the prophetic, 
point two, the particulars, point three, the platform, point four, the process, and point five, the product. Let me go a little bit deeper in those points. Point number one, the prophetic. What is the final image of what you want to make, what you want to see? Point two, the particulars, the ingredients needed, including clean hands and an apron. Point three, the platform, the table or flat surface to provide a firm foundation for the process. Point four, the process, following directions, having a method. Point five, the product, after being placed in the right container, placed in the right environment, the heat of the oven, you have a finished product. Church, I invite you to diligently hear, view, understand the lesson that is about to be presented in demonstration to you by our deaconess in training, Sister Danielle Vaughns. Enjoy to the fullest. Blessings abound. As the, the reading has already been taken place by pastor, I will first pray and then I will go right into the teaching. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you have given me the opportunity to stand before your people, Father God, and bring forth what you have been hidden in my spirit for quite some time, Father God. I pray, Lord God, that you use me, Father God, to speak to your people, Father God, and that you open up hearts, Father God, that they may hear, Father God, what you had initially spoken to me, Father God, concerning this message. Father God, I pray, Father God, that you strengthen me, Father God, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been working in, in a professional kitchen since the age of 19. I have worked in many areas of the kitchen, from a simple prep cook, when I was doing everybody's runt work. For, for about three months, I would do nothing but peel potatoes, peel carrots, cut broccoli, cut cauliflower for eight to nine hours a day, five to six days a week for three months. Interesting. I, I then went from there to working the breakfast line and omelet station and moved my way up to doing lunch a la carte, pizza, garden manger, which is cold apps, salads, and desserts. Um, I went into the pastry shop, I went into the bake shop, and then um, I learned how to do banquet cooking where I cooked for hundreds. And then I went into the high intensity cooking of working as a line chef for a la carte dinner. I guarantee you this is not an easy task. With the capability of working in many aspects of the kitchen, if you ask me what my favorite thing to do out of all that that I know how to do, I would have to say it's making bread. Something that is seemingly so simple but requires a master's hand to really perfect it. So come along with me as I go through the process of making bread as it relates to the life of a Christian. With point number one, the prophetic. Before I even begin to prepare a single ingredient, I must first know what kind of bread I want to make and what ingredients are needed. I must see and know what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Just like how I have a vision of my end product, so does God. God has a plan for each of our lives from before the foundation of the world. Psalms 139 verse 16 says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed in your book. They were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand we should walk in them. We too must also have a vision of what we want. Our ultimate goal as believers is to get to heaven. And the only way to do that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul, in his letter to the church in Philippi, assures the church that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is a process. Just like our bread-making process, the next step in the process are the particulars. What are the particulars? They are any ingredient or tool that is required to make your bread. In order to make bread, 
you must have a few basic things. The ingredients, a scale or measuring cup for properly measuring the ingredients, clean hands and a clean workstation to knead the bread. So let's take a closer look at our ingredients. We have four basic ingredients. Flour, salt, yeast, and water. Each of these are attributes of God. The flower represents kindness and expansion. It represents the church in this instance. We have salt here, which represents Jesus Christ and the word of God. We have yeast, which represents us as people. And we have the water, which represents the Holy Spirit. As we have established what each ingredient means, and as I go throughout the lesson, I'll, I'll reestablish it. But you have an understanding of when I, when I make mention of the ingredients, you'll, you'll have an understanding. So let's take a look at the yeast that I have here. This yeast that I have is called active dry yeast. And it, it is full of potential, but it is not yet living up to its purpose. In order to remain in this state, it must be in a cool, dark place, away from light, air, and moisture. These same things also represent God. God being the light of the world, the breath of God, and the water being the Holy Spirit. Before we come into fellowship with God, we are living a life in a state of darkness and sin. We are not living up to our full potential. So going to be a little active demonstration. Okay, so I have the yeast here. I got my measuring spoons, and I am going to measure out two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. Remember, this represents us. Quarter. So, here we are in our state before we get introduced to God. And then, the Holy Spirit. We go to church, we have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and now the yeast is activated. If we take a look back with, at, at our yeast, we have just added water to the yeast, now activating it. The water represents the Holy Spirit. When it comes into our lives, it is only then that we can begin to live up to our full purpose that was intended for us from the beginning. The same thing that killed the yeast before is now the same thing that the yeast needs to thrive. So now that we have our ingredients and we know each one, what each one represents, Let's take a look at the importance of measuring each ingredient out properly. It is important to measure out the ingredients properly. You can't just throw things together and expect to have a good bread. In order to have a good bread, you have to have a right balance of ingredients. The right amount of flour to water to yeast to salt. If the ratios are off, the bread will not be right. So let's take a look at a couple examples of improper ratios. You might have the right amount of flour, yeast, and salt, but not enough water. So you get a bread that is going to be hard, stale, and is not going to last long. This can be like certain people within the church. They might have been there for years and years and years, and the family might have purchased a pew there. But if they don't have the Holy Ghost, then they're grumpy, they're, they're hard, they're stale, they're not relatable. You can't, you can't relate it to the people. They need a good dose of the Holy Ghost. If you have a bread with not enough salt or no salt at all, then the yeast gets carried away. A dough without salt will rise faster, and when you bake it, you will see large, irregular holes in the bread where the yeast, yourself, got carried away. You have big holes, and they don't get filled with Jesus or the Word. They get filled with everything else from outside in the world. You have to put salt 
in the bread. Yes. Salt also adds flavor and in- controls yeast growth. Without applying the word of God to our lives, we get out of control and live anyway. Salt helps to tighten the gluten structure, and it adds strength to the dough. Without Jesus and the word, you will be weak. The word keeps you tight. Another example is too much yeast in the dough. If you have too much yeast, then it will rise quickly and it will be unstable. The bread will quickly collapse because it needs flour to hold it firm. It becomes unstable. If we are not joined to a good church with good Bible teaching, then our self will take over and we won't last long. These are just a few examples of why it is important to have a balanced life as a Christian. We need to be in relationship with a church body that preaches Jesus and where the Holy Spirit has its way. And point three is the platform. Just as important as it is to have all your ingredients measured out properly with the right ratio, it is also important to have the right workspace. In order to knead the dough properly, you must have a firm, stable work counter. It is important to have a firm foundation so that you can properly knead the dough. If you have a surface that is weak and unstable, then you risk not having a good product, and it is also dangerous. Now let's consider that the one kneading the dough is the pastor of a church. One of the jobs as the pastor is to help form the members with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The pastor must make sure that the church is founded upon godly principles and upholds the standard set by God. This is that firm foundation. If there is no firm foundation, then the pastor at the church can damage the people, and this damage can lead many right out of the church, and this is dangerous. This is why it is so important to have good relationship with the church. It is important that the pastor is in right relationship with first God and then his members so that he or she can help grow them spiritually. This is like the relationship with Paul to the church in Philippi. The nature of this letter is from Paul's heart. He wrote to them while he was a prisoner. He was literally chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day while he was waiting a sentence in for spreading the gospel message. In verses 3 and 4, we see that Paul is thankful to God for them and joyfully keeps them in prayer. Paul was thankful because the church took up an offering to send to Paul to help take care of him while he was in prison. And you can read that in Acts chapter 16. Even through adversity, Paul is still joyful. A life lived in relationship with Christ trumps over all adverse circumstances. Paul remembers them in prayer. Best remembrance of our friends is to remember them before the throne of God. This is a true friendship. Any good relationship is one of balance. Give and take. Not just give, 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 and not just take. It's all about balance. The pastor must also have clean hands in order to work the dough. Without clean hands, anything that is on the hands of the pastor will contaminate the dough. Clean hands and a pure heart to serve God is a must. And point four is the process. What is a process? A process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. The end product that we are trying to achieve is our bread. We have begun the process of getting our ingredients together in right proportions, and we have our clean and strong work surface, and now it's time to knead some dough. So, we can see the yeast here is starting to activate. We can see bubbles forming there. And what we're going to do first is I'm going to measure out the flour. I need three and three quarters cups of flour. Remember, you can't just pour it in. You can't wing it like Grandma used to. She knew what her hand size was. One... Three. 
Okay, so we have our flour, three and three quarters of a cup. And now we're going to add our salt, one and a half teaspoons. So the flour represents the church once again. And the salt is Jesus and the word. So I need one and a half, one, two, three, one and a half. Okay, so we have our flour and our salt. Mix it up. And then we're going to add our yeast mixture. Okay. Once I've added the yeast, we take a look at what's going on. And you can see that the yeast started to bubble. Yep, it's starting to do its thing. It is getting bubbly and it is growing. And just like a new Christian, when they come in, they're bubbly and they're, they're excited and they're ready to take on the whole world. And they're, they're ready to work. This process is take, that is taking place is called fermentation. The yeast is constantly reproducing itself through a process of mitosis. Um, and the yeast is actually changing. The moment that the Holy Spirit was added to the yeast, it began to change. The moment that the Holy Spirit is added to your life, you will begin to change. Now, I will add my water. So here I have the water, which is the Holy Spirit. And the recipe calls for one and a half cups. But you can't add it all at once. It's... You start with some, and you mix it up. And why is it important that you don't add it all at once? Because there's many factors that come into play when making bread. Some of the factors can be the humidity in the air, the amount of moisture that is in the actual flour, the temperature of the room. There's many factors. That can, that can play into the making of your bread. You gotta, you gotta feel it out. So as you, as you mix it, let me start getting a dough. This is the process. So just like how different, different factors play into how the dough will come out, like humidity and temperature, those are, those are just like factors in our life. We all have different things in our life that will hinder or help with our growth. Some things are easily changeable, like the temperature of the room. If you have the AC on, you can turn it off. It's going to get hot. Other things, like the humidity in the air, or the moisture in the flour is not as controllable. So some things are easy for us to change, and some, some stuff is a little more, takes a little more time. Kneading the dough takes a lot of work. <laughs> Muscles. Grow. Muscles. What, what's going on in this bowl is stretching and pulling and pressing and knowing when to add more water, know when to stop, and you keep kneading. Well, now, what, what I would do is I would take this and I would put it onto the table, and I would actually press it out. But for tonight, I won't do that. But you, get, you get the point. The point is that you have to keep going. And you keep kneading. And you would do this pushing and pulling and stretching for about 10 minutes or until you feel that the dough is ready, okay? Remember, the person needing the dough is like pastor. Because she is in relationship with us, she knows how to stretch us. She knows how to push us so that we will reach our full potential. We just have to trust the process. It won't always be nice or easy, but being stretched and pulled will yield a good bread. This process we can also call sanctification. The purpose of kneading 
along with the right amount of water, is so that you develop the gluten that is in the flour. Gluten is what provides the bread with elasticity and chewiness. So the elasticity, I can push the bread, and it's going to bounce back, if you've done it right. <laughs> you keep kneading the dough till you reach a stage called full development. A fully developed dough should be able to stretch between your fingers and have a thin pane that you can see light through without breaking. Without full development, when the dough is stretched out, it meets resistance and it will break. And then you know the dough needs some more work. One here that I did at work today. So you take this, if I was making the bread, I would take this dough after kneading it and kneading it, and I would stretch it out. And I would keep stretching and keep stretching till you get like this. If it rips immediately, then you know that the dough needs to be worked more, or it might need some more water. It might need another dose of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you'll keep working it. If I can stretch it thin and I can see the light through it, then I know it's ready. It's ready to go. So Paul told the Philippians in verse 6 that he was confident that they will get through this. And in verse 7, he says, As both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel... You all are partakers with me of grace. The work of grace is a good work, a blessed work, for it makes us good. It makes us like God and fits us for the enjoyment of God that we may be called a good work. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Through this kneading process and sanctification, we are being transformed into God's image, if we allow it. We are being stretched along with the guidance of the Holy Spirit to rid ourselves of anything that is not like God. Once you reach full development, the dough is put into a warm place to rise for some time, and then it is punched down and shaped so that it can be put into the pan size and then allowed to rise again until it has reached at least double in size. And then point five is the product. Now it's time for the dough to go into the oven. Once your dough is risen, you take it and you put it into the oven. The heat of the oven represents battles of life that every believer goes through. If we, as believers, are living a life that we are called to, allowing the kneading process to push, pull, form, shape, and grow us, then it is inevitable that we will face some difficult times as believers. But God arms us with the sword of the word of God and equips us with his strength, wisdom, and discernment through his own spirit to stay strong in the battle. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. When the bread is in the oven, it grows a little bit more, and then it forms a crust on the outside. The bread is sealed. The same thing happens with us when we face the heat of the battle. God seals us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And 1 Peter chapter... 1 verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God will seal you and he will keep you. Even when we are in the heat of the battle, the word of God assures us that we are protected. Oftentimes, when bakers have their bread in the oven, they will spray it with water and that creates steam. This steam causes the bread to form an even harder crust. So when we go through, what should we do? Spray yourselves with the Holy Ghost.
I don't want to get the stream, the stream one. I want to get the, the spray one. <laughs> spray yourself with the Holy Ghost. The more you spray, the tougher you will come out. You will go through trials seemingly with ease that has others asking you, how are you dealing with this situation so well? And you tell them it's the Holy Spirit. The less water or steam that you apply, then the softer the crust is. Like this. This bread, I didn't put any steam on when I baked it. It's nice, soft, soft bread. <laughs> this bread here, it's gone a little soft now because of the steam in the bag. But anyway, when you bake it in the oven, you spray it once it gets into the oven. And you spray it a few times, and it, it forms a harder crust. Yeah? The more you spray it in the oven, the harder the crust forms. So it's just like us. When we go through trials, what do we do? Do we run and cower, or do we spray ourselves with some of the Holy Spirit? Yeah? So that firms us up. We got a, we got a thick skin almost. Yeah? So we are firm and well able to take on life. If you, if, if you don't spray, then you're weak and allowing life to get you down. The choice is really yours. What will you do when you go through the trials? Do you get into your word and allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen you? Or do you handle yourself like the world does with vices that only make you weak? After baking the bread in the oven, it is now ready to come out of the oven. The smell of the bread permeates the air. And the aroma travels so far. Everyone who passes by remarks at the wonderful scent, and everybody wants some. This is how we as believers should be. We should be a sweet aroma that fills the room of every place that we are in. The people who come near us should know our aroma and that we are Christians. And they should want some of our bread. They should want the freshness of our bread. Bread, it's such an essential part of life and provides us with strength and nourishment. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He was tried and tested, went through the agony of taking on our sins and taking them to the grave so that we may have life once again. We have a relationship with God the Father. In John chapter 6, verse 32 to 35, Jesus is speaking and says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, will never hunger or thirst again. Jesus is essential, for he is spiritual bread that brings eternal life. Amen. Amen.